Oh, Sanders. In the last two weeks, we have heard alternative approaches to the taxation of foreign non-domiciles. Will the Prime Minister confirm that he is confident that the government's approach will target people who can realistically be expected to be able to pay the tax? It, it, is, it is right that uh, people pay their fair share, and we have taken action against avoidance uh, every year for the last uh, ten years. But I, I have to point out to the House, and this is going to be a debate that is going to be held over the next uh, period of time, that the proposal that you can find 150,000 non-domiciles to tax is completely wrong. There are only 115,000 registered in this country, but only 15,000 of these non-domiciles have the earnings and income that would allow them to consider that paying £25,000 in taxation was in their interest. Others are nurses who earn little more than £25,000, teachers who earn little more than £25,000. And when we asked where these calculations came, they came from accountancy age, then referred back to the Observer newspaper, then referred back to what was a so-called tax expert who was unnamed. And I think those people who put forward proposals to tax non-domicile and say they can raise three and a half billion will have to do better in the future. Sir Patrick Cornmike, could the Prime Minister give us a cheerful answer and tell me whether he believes that imitation is the surest way to salvation or merely the sincerest form of flattery? When we made the Bank of England independent, they opposed it and now support it. When we created a minimum wage, they opposed it and now support it. When we invested in the health service, they opposed it and now support it. I know who's been leading the argument in this country. It's the Labour Party. Does the Prime Minister think that people who want to return to work but have become trapped in the incapacity benefit system should be supported and encouraged to seek and obtain work or should be forced to do so by removing their benefit? Yeah, Mr Speaker, it, it, th there is a very interesting debate also to be had on the future of incapacity benefit in this country. And my honourable friend is absolutely right. Under our proposals, a million people, a million people will come off incapacity benefit uh, by 2015. There is an alternative proposal that says that figure could be 1.6 million. In other words, two-thirds of people on incapacity benefit at the moment would come off incapacity benefit. Each would lose £5,000 per person, and that would raise, for a particular proposal put forward on the other side, £3 billion. Now, I ask the House, given the constituents that we know who are disabled in wheelchairs, many who are mentally as well as physically handicapped, the idea that 1.6 million of 2.7 million people could come up in capacity benefit by the beginning of the next Parliament is faintly ridiculous. And those people who say they can raise £3 billion from that particular proposal, given that we are already expecting a million to come off in capacity benefit, are again completely wrong. Prime Minister, that on an occasion some time ago there was an announcement made about Northern Ireland losing many of its army installations. And a promise was made in a joint statement uh, that the people of Northern Ireland would benefit uh, from what was done with these particular uh, government, uh, government uh, ownership. Uh, could the Prime Minister give me assurance today that that will be done and could he announce the time when it will be done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I hope, I hope that the Right Honourable uh, uh, Member, uh, who, who is the First Minister in, in Northern Ireland, will accept that the public expenditure settlement uh, that was uh, reached uh, yesterday was very much in line with uh, what we had talked about previously, indeed was higher than the figures I'd given him before. And I will certainly look at what he says about uh, land in, in Northern Ireland, just as I'm looking, as I promised to do, at the corporate tax regime in Northern Ireland, and perhaps we can talk about these, these issues at a later date. Gilroy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, can I welcome the recent uplift in the minimum wage, which is helping 90,000 people in the South West? And can I ask the Prime Minister to guarantee that the future of the minimum wage will be assured as long as he is Prime Minister? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the rise in the minimum wage, which came in October the 1st, is, 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 one of the, uh, is a rise in the minimum wage from its initial £3.60 
and it is now at £5.35. It will continue to rise, obviously subject to economic conditions, but what in addition to that we've achieved in the last few years is a minimum wage for teenagers, and we also on October the 1st were able to introduce the first, the first number of days of paid holiday entitlement for workers in this country. Again a sign that if we can keep the economy moving forward, have stable economic growth, then the rewards will flow to the whole of the population and not just some of the population. Green. The Prime Minister recently described Burma as one of the world's darkest corners and said that human rights are universal. But his government is still trying to deport Burmese dissidents into the hands of that dreadful regime. Can he tell the House why his moral compass has failed to identify this transparent hypocrisy? I I will certainly look at any individual cases he brings to me and and look at them uh, sympathetically. But there is an appeals uh, system for people... There is an appeals system, and, and that will be dealt with. Can I, say, can I say on Burma, I hope there will be all party support. This is a repressive and illegitimate regime. Aung San Suu Kyi was the elected democratic leader of Burma, and the sanctions that we will step up in the European Union are sanctions that are necessary to tell that Burmese regime that what they are doing is completely unacceptable. And I hope the Secretary General of the United Nations will be able uh, to lead a United Nations team that will bring reconciliations to the people of Burma. Uh, David Blunkett. Uh, Will my right honourable uh, friend agree that the reported statement from the Association of British Insurers on future cover for flood damage is deeply unhelpful and will lead people and will and will lead people to conclude that the industry wishes to remove any commercial risk to their own profits and place that risk instead on the current and future policy holders, including the families and businesses in my own Sheffield constituency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm grateful to my right honourable friend. I, I think what the Association of British Insurers have announced today is a review into the practices for the future. I hope they will not take uh, the step that he is suggesting uh, might be considered to deny people insurance. But I also, I also have to say, again in the interest of accuracy, that over the summer period, and very recently, the Association of British Insurers have been asking that by 2011, uh, we spend 750 million a year on flood defences. The figures we have announced yesterday are that we have raised flood defences from 600 million this year to 800 million in 2011. So I hope whatever difference there is, 800 million in 2011, and I hope whatever difference there is between the Association of British Insurance and us, which is very small on the figures that are involved, we can show, as a result of the Pitt report, which will come soon, that we are doing everything we can to improve flood defences in this country. 